What's up guys, Kara Corey here, registered dietitian. If you are new here, then thank you for joining me. If you're not, then welcome back. It is January and I am having so much fun making these videos. And for today's video, we are going to do a full on decade review. That's right, from 2010 to 2020, we're gonna talk about the best of and the worst of in terms of wellness, health trends, diets, food trends, all that good stuff, just kind of wrapped up into one fun package here on the YouTubes. So before we jump right into this video, if you guys are interested, then be sure to hit the like button right now. Go on, hit it. It helps me if you hit it, just hit it. Also make sure you guys are subscribed. You can even hit the little post notification bell. That's gonna let you guys know each and every time I upload, I do, pretty much put out two videos a week or so. So that way you guys can know to come hang out with me. And I'm also pretty active in the comments too. So I do like to connect with you guys. I'm here to answer your questions. I even answer questions on videos that I did like five years ago. I will holler you back down there. So we've got a lot, of, a lot to discuss from the past decade. And I wanna jump even further back when I think about for myself, um, in the 1990s, it, that was kind of known to be the era, the decade in terms of dieting. That was like the low fat era, the low fat decade. If you guys remember that, that's when we kind of thought fat was bad for us. The Snackwell's cookies came about and we were all low fat everything, but we didn't really take into consideration portion size. So what happened was we ate tons of low fat stuff and we just ate more and more of it. And we became fatter and fatter as, as Americans and the world essentially with the obesity epidemic has grown. It is not just America, it is other countries. Um, so that kind of stands out to me as the 1990s theme. 2000s, uh, it was about 2002, 2003, Atkins was huge, maybe a little bit before then, but really kind of 2000 to 2010 seemed to be the low carb decade. It was primarily Atkins focused, Atkins really, just poof, through the roof. You can still find their products available. I think they came out with like frozen meals and bars and shakes and all that jazz still available. Um, you know, Slim Fast was in there a bit as well. Um, what else? The Zone Diet, if you guys remember that. Those were kind of the biggies from that decade. And so when I sat down to kind of brainstorm this video, I'm like, geez, what has been, you know, I can think about the hot trends the past year, but what has been the decade, what has been this past decade. And when it all comes down to it, it's very interesting because I feel like it's been a decade in which we are more health focused. I believe we are more wellness focused. It's been the year of incorporating in kombuchas and more self care and just thinking about your health. But at the same time, I feel like this decade to me was a decade of extremes. So when I think about even the food trends and the diet trends, super extreme, more extreme than the era of Snackwell cookies and Atkins. We just had so many extreme diet trends come about this past 10 years. So I wanted to kind of, I'm not going to go into full details. You guys have heard me discuss some of these diets and other videos and thoughts on them, but I'm going to kind of quickly review some of the biggies that stood out from this year and some of the good and bad things. You know, there is some good that came out of the past 10 years in terms, in terms of health and nutrition, but um, one of the number one things, and this is not a diet. Well, some people may say it's a diet, but one of the big things that stands out to me the past 10 years are the tea detoxes or the tea detoxes, if you will. And I really hope that that just dies. Like I'm cool. If you want to drink some tea, drink some herbal tea, as long as it doesn't interact with your medications, you know, have yourself a warm glass of tea. If it helps you sleep at night, if it helps you get your fluid goals in, if you like green tea and it just tastes good and it gives you that kickstart to your day, I'm here for all those reasons. But the amount of money that have been made off these detox teas, I can't even fathom. Yet we're still here and we're still buying it. I think it's time that people quit buying these detox teas and understand that there is no need to buy a tea 
to help you lose weight because that's just not how it works. And if anything's telling you and marketing it to you that you need this to detox and lose weight, that's an absolute lie. You have a liver. There's an organ inside your body, it's called the liver, and that is your natural detoxifier if it's working properly. Your body has its own natural detoxification processes that it goes through every single day. You want to think about making good food choices that help you become a better detoxifier, but you don't need to go on a detox or a detox. Did I just create that word or is that like an actual thing? But the teas have unfortunately been not one of the best parts of this past decade in terms of health and fitness trends. And I really hope that that one does not come along for the ride in this new decade. Another big wellness kind of trend the past 10 years, and I 100 attribute this to social media. And when you think about social media, it's really, really come about the past 10 years. I mean, Facebook has been there. There's been social media. There was the MySpace days, but Instagram has really become a place of business. And one of the big trends this past years, past 10 years is people getting the health and fitness and wellness information from unqualified people, people that have no business telling you what to do for your health. It's kind of crazy to me. It's like, I, I don't know um, what to relate it to. I guess going just like if I need to have surgery, it's like me going to a football player for surgery. It doesn't make any sense. Do you see what I'm saying here? And so it's not to say that there has to be set credentials for someone to be qualified. I'm not even going there. I'm not saying you can only take advice from a registered dietitian or a doctor because I've met plenty of idiot doctors, and you might think I'm an idiot dietitian, right? Because some of us have different ideas and beliefs. Bottom line is some people are out there on Instagram just trying to make a quick dollar. And I've seen, in terms of the small fitness world I feel like I belong to on social media, you see the common thing where people compete and then all of a sudden they're a trainer, all of a sudden they're a coach, all of a sudden they're a dietitian and they're taking clients and they're giving you meal plans and they're telling you uh, how to go about losing weight the correct way. And it's scary. To me, that's a very scary place to be. And if you're someone that just looks up to someone, you just, you want to trust them. You want to think that they're gonna give you the best information and that they're gonna have your, your health in mind and that they're gonna steer you in the right direction, but that's just not the case. So this has just been a decade of people, number one, giving advice they shouldn't be giving, number two, people taking advice from people they shouldn't be taking advice from. So we need to just stop doing that. And again, it doesn't always come down to, well, they have the credential or they don't. I am a firm believer some people don't have the credential, but they have years and years of experience and they have proof and they have testimonials and you just, you do your research and you know that this person is gonna guide you the right way. Sometimes you have to go with your gut feeling on these things too. But I don't know how many people I've worked with and talked to that have gotten the worst advice in terms of their diet and all it's done is set them back and really, cause them issues. It's caused them a lot of issues. So let's just, let's just not do that anymore. Let's just try to, number one, if, uh, if you can't do the research yourself, if you can't figure out what you need to on your own, take the time to research those people that you're going to work with. Don't just work with them because they have a set following on Instagram. Don't just work with them because you think their body looks good. Um, do it for the right reasons and make sure you research it because as much as people want to blame coaches, I think we have to be the ones to blame too. You, you as the consumer need to take the time, do your homework, do your research first, or it comes back on you. So I said, this is the year of extremism and I mean that the year. So I said, this is like the decade of extremism. And I mean it because I Got my little notebook here. I wrote down kind of a list of the most popular diets that you've heard of throughout this decade, many of which are still floating around, but you can tell they kind of, we go through waves with these diets where they're just so popular, they're so hot, you never think it's gonna die down. But look at Adkins, how many times do you ask someone 
How many times do you hear someone actually say they're on the Adkins diet? It's just not something you really hear anymore, right? So these things always come and go. They do. You can fight me on this if you want ketos, but they do. Some of these fad diets come and go. So big diets this decade with no scientific evidence behind them for some of these. Keto, let's just get keto out of the way right now. You know I've brought it up before. Keto does have medical backing. I am here to tell you, I do think keto has a time and a place. I think there are certain individuals who can respond from keto, who can make health benefits, who can have significant improvements in certain health markers by doing keto. However, I feel the verdict is still out if this is truly a sustainable, lifelong diet, okay? I, I just, that's where I'm at, but this is, this is the hottest one right now, you guys. It is the hottest one, and it was also rated the worst, the worst diet of 2019. Um, in an article I recently read, I can't remember where I got it from though. I, I can link it for you if you'd like, but that's probably the number one hot diet on the market right now. Um, other biggies that we have from this decade, paleo. I think some people are still doing paleo, but I don't think it's as huge as it was earlier on in this decade. You know, I feel like for whatever reason, CrossFit and paleo kind of came in hot, hand in hand, like holding hands, singing kumbaya, and everyone was on the paleo bandwagon, you know, going back to a time where we ate like our ancestors, which I don't get me wrong, there's some principles there that aren't, they're not bad principles for how you're gonna eat. Um, where you'll always find me having issue with the fad dieting is the restrictions that are within them that are unnecessary and that it's very black and white. It, it's very black and white and I just don't think it needs to be that black and white for how we eat and how we diet. And let's take a moment, the word diet in itself, how does it make you feel? I'd love for you to stop right now. Leave me a comment down below. When you hear the word diet, what comes to mind? How does that make you feel? I think for most of us, it makes us feel negative. Uh, it makes me feel slightly hungry when I think about the word diet. But I think moving into this new decade, I'd love to see it continue with that wellness focus, but kind of making diet an okay word again. We all are on a diet. We all eat food. We all consume energy. We all consume calories, you know, one way or another. And that is called a diet. So I'd love to remove the negative connotation that comes with that word, you know, because I think, and I've even received feedback on here too, when I talk about a diet, people assume I'm in some restrictive phase where I'm eating 800 calories. And that's just absurd. Uh, we all diet. You eat food, you diet, okay? So let's just remove the negative connotation from it. And that's part of my mission here is let's just, let's remove that. Let's remove the labels. Let's get away from this extremism of where we're all at. But with the extremism has come plenty of other diets this decade, one of them being the carnivore one. This one has come in towards the end of the decade. So I feel like we could see this one sliding into 2020. Um, I really don't know anyone who's done this diet other than following Jordan Peterson and his daughter and how they claim it has helped them with anti-inflammatory issues. Where my mind goes with all that is just the fact that when you're having so much of a response to certain food groups and you go through an elimination where you're only consuming one food group, it kind of makes sense to me why it would be life-changing, why it would kind of make you feel better if you're removing all the foods that are potentially causing you issues. I do feel at some point you need to add back in the food. I'm not anti trying an elimination approach. I think elimination diets are important. They have a time and a place working with a dietitian or a medical professional to assist you with teasing out what works and what doesn't work if you truly have medical issues. If you are truly having responses that you can't figure out with the diet, then that is where that elimination diet is key. Um, but the carnivore kind of takes it to an extreme that I'm not comfortable with and I would never recommend for someone quite simply. Another very restrictive diet that was popular this decade was the Whole30. Um, again, Whole30 is kind of 
to me, okay concepts. Uh, I just find, you know, I don't think that it's anything bad what you're eating. It's not like you're only eating grapefruit or cabbage soup or something ridiculous like we've seen in the past. However, I just find it to be too restrictive and not sustainable. Um, you know, just having the rules that are surrounding it, I find pretty restrictive. So I think some of the concepts, again, can just be healthy eating and you don't have to be Whole30 and you don't have to be paleo and in this label. But, you know, some of the concepts in some of these diets are not bad. It's just the fact that it eventually most of these restrict you too much where you can't sustain it and then you fall off the wagon, you fall off hard and you you go deep. Do you know what I'm saying? Like you just, you, you go from eating fruits and vegetables and whole grains, but like, I can't eat any added sugars. And then all of a sudden, like all you're eating is fast food and cakes and cookies. Like it's literally one extreme to the next, right? With some of these yo-yo diets and in yo-yo dieters. So that's where I'm like, this is unnecessary. Let's just, let's meet in the middle if we can here. Um, another big diet that you will probably have seen on my channel since I started this channel this decade is clean eating. And I think clean eating is still a term. It's still a thing people use. It was a term I used and talked about in the, in the early days of YouTube, which have now humbled me because I'm, I'm just against it. I'm against that thought process of it, it kind of coincides with good and bad foods and that I'm, I'm just the mental part of how we view food and talk about food and our relationship with food, that's got to change first, you guys. And so clean eating, while it sounds great, like, yeah, it's just like healthier eating. There's no set definition for clean eating. So it really depends what definition you're utilizing. And I just feel like it gives off that connotation that if you're not eating clean food, you're eating dirty food. And dirty food, is that good food? No, you're thinking dirty food is junk food. It's bad. It's not good. And the more you take that mindset about food being good or bad, mm, it, it doesn't go well for most of us. You need to just come to a place where some food offers more nutritional benefits than others. But I'm also going to tell you it's okay to have a slice of cake once in a while, or it's okay to have some pizza with your family on a Friday night. There is a balance that can be put into place there while living a healthy lifestyle. So adhering to these very extreme diets is unnecessary. Juicing has been another big trend this decade, um, whether it's ordering like the cold pressed juices or going on a full, full on juicing detox, if you will. People really started doing this trend of juicing and that's all they'd have for anywhere from like three to 10 days. Ultimately, yeah, you're still consuming calories, but all you can have is juice. And I find it to be restricting. Uh, no one's gonna be satisfied from only drinking juice and it's unnecessary. I, I There's just no real need behind it, um, but Again, one of those big trends, I feel like that one has kind of died down. I don't I don't hear as many people doing that. I'm not sure if it's because people are scared of carbs still or if it's just, you know, but people were buying the Vitamixes left and right and only juicing. Um, just something you cannot sustain. I have not seen any scientific scientific literature that supports where juicing for X amount of days provides any long-term health benefits. So that's that in a nutshell. Um, other biggies are the alkaline diet. I feel like the alkaline diet was really big around the clean eating phase as well. I actually just had someone ask me about this the other day, if it was worth the money buying alkaline water versus not. I mean, are you measuring the pH of your body? Are you measuring the pH of your urine? And I don't think we've seen any true literature on maintaining an alkaline diet. There are some good concepts in there with eating more alkaline-based foods, but then there are some things that it restricts and takes out that I find unnecessary. So no, you do not need to just put yourself in this little box of what pH your body's gonna be. Your body is able to uh, manipulate and maintain that pH on its own. Another biggie is intermittent fasting. I think this one will continue. Um, this is gonna be uh, continue to be a big dieting trend. I feel like dieting trend, I guess it's not necessarily a diet. It's kind of more 
it's just a trend. It's a food trend, right? Because it restricts your window of how frequently you're eating. With intermittent fasting, it's similar to other uh, diets I've mentioned here today that you know, depending on how you do it, it can be a little bit different. Some people do it where they just fully fast for a day, two days, three days, and then other people just do the intermittent fasting where they just lessen the window within a 24 hour period of time, don't necessarily change the calories. I feel like there isn't anything magical about this approach, but what it can do is help people be more adherent on their diet if they're eating in a smaller window because you're feeling more full and satisfied because you're eating in a shorter period of time, if that, if that makes sense. So more calories in a shorter amount of time, you're gonna feel more full. Um, I've done intermittent fasting myself. What I don't like is I do feel like it kind of takes away the, your body's ability to kind of listen to hunger and satiety cues. So again, if this isn't something you're gonna do for life, um, I know some people say they intermittent fast you know, not intentionally, it just happens. Um, but you are kind of almost not listening to your hunger satiety cues with that diet. You're just setting this this time frame based on what, and that's where you can eat within. So it does lead into those food rules that I do think can have long-term consequences when you go away from focusing your diet in that kind of a way. Another big one of the decade too, and I would say this is kind of more in later years, I haven't touched upon this much on this channel, but another kind of trend, if you will, with eating techniques is food combining. And that's another one that I just don't feel is necessary. The thought process behind food combining is, you know, you've got yourself a list of do's and don'ts with what you eat together and don't eat together that is supposed to help optimize digestion. And I think all of us should think about digestion and what feels right and what, you know, foods that we do combine together, how we feel energy wise, digestively, performance, mentally, all that good stuff. But at the end of the day, there isn't one magical list of what you have to combine and not combine. So it just feeds into those food rules and it's a one size fits all approach with all of these diets I've mentioned. It's, it's here it is cookie cutter, here's your diet, that's how you do it. And I just don't feel that there is one set way that we all need to eat, drink, or live our lives. Genetically, biologically, we're all different people. We all have different makeups and different things that are going to feel right for us, especially in terms of digestion. What I digest okay, you may not. So it's very different and just another unnecessary technique in my opinion. I would say those are the bulk of the extreme diets we had this decade that I could come up with. If I'm missing any major ones, please let me know in the comments below because I feel like I sometimes just start to tune out when people are on their newest diet. I mean, every year, if you go into Barnes and Nobles right now, there's probably 20 new diet books of diets I've never even heard of. And so I try to stay abreast of the major ones, the big ones, but I'm sure there's been some other ones in there the past 10 years that I've missed. So let me know below if there's any biggies that uh, you can think of from the past decade. But shifting over to other food trends, good and not all, all bad. Um, one of the big trends I think of just because I am a foodie and are we all foodies now? Like I feel like if you have social media, we're all kind of a foodie. I was someone that always liked taking pictures of my food. Even before the social media days, there was something about it that I enjoyed doing. Um, and now we're kind of in a, you know, do it for the gram type decade is the past decade we had, you know, with, with the different food items we'd eat, with how luxurious they were and making sure we did it for the gram and got that photo for Instagram. And being more of like the bodybuilding mindset, it was like you weren't a bikini girl unless you posted your post-show cheat meal with your burger and fries or whatever it may be. So I think of it as like part of the past decade was like the things we would do for the gram. And I don't know that that's gonna go away because I think social media is just um, such a, it's a big part of our world, right? So I think we'll still keep seeing that moving forward. Another foodie trend that I kind of, I, I don't really mind is more of like the, the meal kits, the food kits, the things like HelloFresh and 
why is HelloFresh the only one I can think of? I know there's quite a few of them nowadays where, you know, you get your meal sent right to you and you've got your little recipe and you just make it up. That's something that's unheard of from prior decades. And I can see where that could be very beneficial for people who just don't have time. I myself am someone that just, I love grocery shopping. I love grocery shopping so much to the point that I don't need groceries and I'll be like, I want to go to grocery, I want to go to Aldi's or I want to go to Trader Joe's and do a haul just because I enjoy food and grocery shopping that much. So I'm not someone that would ever want to be dependent on a meal kit like that because it takes the pleasure out of it for me in a way, but I can see the benefit there for people that need something to supplement in for a family with you're very busy and you just kind of want some new ideas too. I don't necessarily think this is a bad trend and um, as long as what I would suggest is making sure that the company that you are buying, like the, the meal kits from, do have good policies, and, or I don't know how you would make sure of this, but ensure that they do have proper things in place in terms of their delivery systems and ensuring food safety. That's the food safety nerd in me comes out with that kind of stuff for any meal kits or pre-made meals and you know all, all that kind of stuff. Just making sure that food safety is adhered to and that they have good practices in place, a good HACCP plan, if you will, for my foodie nerds so that you're not getting sick. So that's the only thing with that one. Other foodie trends in this one I kind of like, but I feel like it's been the decade of bowls, if you will, acai bowls or smoothie bowls have been huge, um, like grain bowls, any kind of grain bowl, and then poke bowls too, which I love all of those, I'm not gonna lie, but I do feel like it's been the decade of bowls. It's very trendy when you're going out to eat, and something about acai bowls. I'm not like a huge acai bowl person, and what I will say is I'm not against it, but I also say buyer beware because acai bowls, even though yes, it's from a fruit, and can have things like peanut butter and granola and coconut and more fruit on top of it. I think sometimes people think those are like a snack and they can easily be upwards of a thousand or more calories. So just kind of be aware if you're someone buying things like that. Number one, they can get rather pricey. Um, they are delightful, but just be mindful of the amount of calories with the toppings that you're placing on it. It's It ends up being like, a you know, you have to think about it with Froyo when people go out for frozen yogurt. Ooh, it's kind of been the decade for Froyo too and like putting your own toppings on stuff. But it's the toppings that can get you. So you kind of have to be careful with some of those toppings and how over the top you're going with it, right? So, um, but grain bowls, poke bowls, I think those are fabulous. I think anything that kind of makes your food more fun, there's nothing wrong with that. There's something fun about having a good bowl of junk, not junk. There's something fun about just having like a bowl of food that you enjoy. And I actually did this um, not that long ago. I bought a couple like bigger, just like nice bowls and dishes. And there's something about even though I'm eating the same exact food or meal, putting it in the bowl, it's more satisfying. And I know that sounds dumb, but sometimes something as simple as getting new dishware or having things that are just more more aesthetic and make your meal more aesthetic, it can make you enjoy it more. So. That's just a little aside, but if you are a bowl lover like myself, then that might help you. Another big trend this decade, which I think is a great trend, is more low waste cooking or becoming more of a low waste shopper. So as we've come into this decade, being more wellness and health focused, we've also started to become more focused on the earth and the planet that we're living on and the things that we're doing and how it can be harmful. So you know, just a few things come to mind with shopping and reusable bags have become really big this past decade and will continue. So, you know, I know some local supermarkets, supermarkets, grocery stores, why does supermarket seem like a funny word, but they're going to forego all their plastic bags and get rid of them. And you have to use a reusable bag. Um, or I think you have to pay. And I mean, Aldi has been doing this for years. I believe Aldi's has never provided you with plastic bags. You've always had to bring your own reusable bags or you could buy one of their reusable bags. So we're seeing more of that. 
We're seeing more, you know, getting rid of plastic straws, things like that. In general, I think we're just being more focused on not having as much waste from the foods that we buy and the foods that we purchase. I can say from experience, I've been trying to be more mindful of that with like produce in particular and not having waste and just being more thought out about how much of it I'm purchasing and what's realistic over the time frame of what will be consumed. So, you know, a once a week grocery shop for produce maybe just doesn't work. So I have to go two or three times a week, buy in smaller amounts to ensure that I'm not creating the same amount of waste. So I think that that's a great trend that we're in right now with just being more mindful of the waste that we're creating and kind of our our footprint in this world that we're leaving. This decade to me, again, I'm coming from what I feel like is a small little fitness bubble, but I think about, um, you know, we went from clean eating to also the if it fits your macros, a flexible dieting approach became really popular and not even within the fitness bubble, it became popular with the general population, you know, learning how to track your macros and be more of a flexible dieter. So I think that's been a big trend this past decade. And I, I personally do think that's been mostly good. Honestly, when I went through school, this is what we learned. We learned to teach people how to track. And part of the issues we, all, we often had with research studies is that food intake was self-reported and we know people under report how much they eat and what they eat. So I don't think it's a bad thing having people learn how to track, how to be mindful of how much they're eating and how to really see it. And some people have taken it to a place of, well, it's too extreme to be tracking every morsel of food and weighing it, and I get that too. I'm not saying it's something you should do for life, but I don't think that that was a bad movement for this decade in terms of helping people be aware of what they're eating and learn where they can make changes, if you will. And on that note, people then also got really into intuitive eating. That was something I learned in college well before this decade, but I think it became really trendy this decade and really popular to learn how to become an intuitive eater. And I love that. I think that's one of the best things that came out of this decade because when you think about all the extreme diets that I mentioned, and then you see some of these people who just want to learn how to become more intuitive, it's not an easy thing. It's not easy when you've been ignoring your hunger satiety cues. It's not easy when you've just adhered to set dietary rules. It almost feels like you don't even know how to eat anymore. So how to become an intuitive eater. And a lot of dietitians are now kind of working with people specializing in intuitive eating and getting people on board with that approach. And I think that's just such a good place to be because it really is, it's taking away that all or nothing mindset and it's helping people go back to basics to learn how to mindfully eat. And it takes time. It, it, it takes a lot of time. It's not something that can be learned overnight. I would say give yourself a year at least to dedicate yourself to it. Um, and when I say that, I don't mean give yourself a year and go off of it. I just mean be patient with yourself for months and months and months because it, it will take time to really re-regulate depending on what your diet history has been and what your medical history has been. So we've had a lot of interesting, we've had a lot of, a lot of extreme things happen this past decade, but I do think we also have had that, that wellness part in us. I kind of think that's why Adkins died because I mean, I know people rumored him as dying of a heart attack. I think he slipped on ice, but it came out that his cholesterol was super high. So I think that's what ruined the Adkins phase. Like, oh, maybe eating eggs and bacon every single meal is not the way to go. Um, so we came into this decade wanting to still be, oh, we're always going to be a society that's focused on how do we fix the obesity epidemic? Um, but how can we do so? and think about our health and lifespan and not just think about getting skinny or thin. And I'm glad that we're here and I hope just more good comes in this next decade. I think it'll be re really cool if I'm here 10 years from now um, doing a video kind of comparing these two. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video, this decade in review. I'm sure there's things that I've missed. So let me know if there's any like standout like decade trends that I missed here in the comments. And I hope you guys did enjoy this video. If you did smash the like button, be sure you are subscribed to me again before you head on out of here. And I hope to hang out with you guys again soon. Bye.